So I, uh, I hope I hope I'm recording here. It says I'm recording. I'm recording from the local public library, the, the kitchen in the basement. It's a little bit cool here and I'm dressed appropriately. I'm going to share my screen and, and uh, move on with this. Spin poster 28 February. This should be it. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, the video, the video here is going to is going to uh, the light here, the light here, it's, it's on a timer of the light with, and I can't get it to reactivate. So it's going to get dark in here in a while and you won't be able to see my face anymore, but that doesn't matter. I think I can still continue with the presentation when it does that. So <clears throat> the, um, I'm a little bit embarrassed. This, this presentation should have been done back in December for, for this symposium in India. And I've just been struggling with uh, this, these concept of spin and dimensionality and topology and how they work together. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to point out is, is that, uh, as you can see here, uh, all of these links are, are live here. You know, I want to go to full screen with this if I can. How do I do that? See, I don't, I don't see that here. I'd like to close this this window over here, but I don't see how to do it. Okay, I'm going to continue with it as it is. <clears throat> so the links are live. So for instance, this Chad GPT explaining the impedance model. Uh, this is pretty interesting how how uh, machine learning can can uh, dive into the literature and come up with a, a excellent explanation of the impedance model. So I, I'd encourage you to look at that. Uh, all of the active links, all of the active links in, in this uh, presentation uh, 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 are available. If you, if you go to uh, this, this, my research gate profile, you'll be able to find this PowerPoint file and, and uh, pursue the links if you're interested in, in learning more about this. So this uh, abstract was accepted uh, to the, <clears throat> the symposium, but it uh, was not presented. As I said, it wasn't done. And what motivated this was the muon collider uh, and how in trying to understand uh, uh, lifetime enhancement in the muon collider, how to make the muons last longer so we can we can do a better job of colliding them. Uh, in the scattering matrix, it turns out that, that uh, we have violation of both uh, conservation of dimensionality and spin. And, and because topology plays in this, then these things are mixed together somehow. And it's, it's not clear how to me yet, but I want to uh, ask for some help on this. So <clears throat> the Muon Collider Forum report, uh, 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 the Snowmass folks, uh, uh, they, they outline a spectacular, spectacular opportunity that, that the Muon Collider has a unique potential that uh, cannot be paralleled. Uh, and, uh, in any technology, and it's very important for the early commu career community. Uh, lacking the muon collider, what's on the horizon after uh, after uh, uh, the LHC is basically either uh, the the future circular collider, a larger version of the LHC, or uh, the international linear collider. And there's really not a lot of new technology or physics in either of those. It's just building the same thing bigger. For the muon collider, it's a neat machine. There's many possibilities for that. So certainly for the young people to have an opportunity to uh, get your teeth into something that, that has the possibility of future development is important. So my in involvement in muon collider came from a, a, a quanta, a quanta uh, 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 article by uh, uh, in which Carl, Carl, Carl Rubia, he called for courage. He said, uh, We've got this dilemma. What do we do next? And he says, you know, look hard at the muon collider. So that's that motivated this this article on on the possibility of low energy muon lifetime enhancement. And the idea here is is that uh, uh, at high energy, uh, we've got the translation gauge fields of the RF cavities, and, and so special relativity uh, gives you a lifetime enhancement at high energy. Uh, but but. Uh, if, if you look at this, this uh, article by John Baez, uh, he, he, he shows the comparison between uh, translation, the Lorentz contraction, and how the cube, instead of being contracted, it's rotated. And the rotation kicks in at low energy. That's where that dominates. And the contraction dominates at high energy. So 
So uh, <clears throat> there's other ways to get a rotation gauge field than accelerating something with translation gauge fields. You can apply the topological impedances directly to get a rotation gauge field. So that's what this uh, proposed here in this uh, uh, 2020 uh, 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 paper, and uh, there's a link to that here. Uh, we want to do low energy muon lifetime enhancement. If we could do that, it'd make the muon collider a little bit easier. And here's a proof of principle experiment. What we're saying in this, uh, this was a SNOMAS uh, white paper per, per, uh, submitted to SNOMAS in May of uh, 2022. And it, it, we, we have the possibility of, of doing a simple and relatively inexpensive uh, proof of principle experiment uh, in the delivery ring of the G-2 experiment at Fermilab. So that's uh, something that I'll be trying to promote here. An outline of what I'm going to go through, I'm just going to blow through this stuff quick. Uh, <clears throat> there was an earlier attempt I made to give this talk, and it, it uh, really devoted too much time to the, to the, first, uh, the first items in this outline. Uh, so I was at an hour by the time I got to the Fano plane, and, and I want to make this much shorter. So I'll go ahead and post the video along with a link uh, on the, my research gauge page. Uh, and so if you check out the PowerPoint file, then you'll also find the link to that hour long video that discusses these topics in detail. And uh, I'm going to just brush over them and then go to the, the final three items here, the phantom plane, the scattering matrix and lifetime enhancement. So uh, starting with the theoretical minimum, uh, what we have is three assumptions, the geometry, the fields and the mass gap. So for the geometry, we're taking the, the fundamental ge geometric objects of, of Q Euclid. <clears throat> the point, line, plane, and volume elements, and this is geometric quantization. And if you look at Clifford algebra, this is the algebra of quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, you find that, that uh, there's, there's four possible algebras, and, and the largest algebra, the algebra that's minimally and maximally complete is the 3D poly algebra of space. This is SO3. And uh, most people are more familiar with the poly algebra in the SU2 representation, which is the double cover of SO3. So the vacuum wave function we take to be is, is first the, the, is, is the fundamental geometric objects of Clifford algebra. It's the same at all scale, whether you're looking at the Compton wavelength of the electron or that of the proton or uh, uh, the Planck particle at, at, the, at the Planck length or, or the boundary of the, the universe. It's, uh, this is the same at all scales. And uh, this gives you eight components. There's eight degrees of freedom here. This is the vacuum wave function. You can also say it's the vacuum string. Uh, like the string theory, it's got eight orthogonal degrees of freedom. Uh, but rather than being the, the string vibrations in an eight-dimensional space, it's uh, the vibration of these uh, eight degrees of freedom in a three-dimensional space. <clears throat> to get to 10 degrees of string theory, uh, in string theory, they go ahead and give the string a dimension, which is the ninth. Oh, the lights just flipped off. Okay. So they give an eighth dimension, uh, a ninth dimension, which is the, uh, the string itself. And then for the 10th dimension, they take time. They put time in by hand. But the reality is if when you, when you, uh, uh, add electric and magnetic flux quanta when you quantize uh, the vacuum uh, wave functions. So we have both geometric quantization and electromagnetic quantization uh, that you end up with 10 degrees of freedom. You can quantize these things by uh, various combinations of the four fundamental constants that define the coupling constant. And, and having, having uh, 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 so you can define geometrically and topologically appropriate flux quanta to these eight, eight wave function components. And this requires the addition of, of uh, electric and magnetic fields. The, the electric and magnetic fields are the additional two degrees of freedom that give you the, the, the quantum electrodynamic string with 10 degrees of freedom. And interactions are, are uh, uh, modeled by the Clifford product. Uh, uh, the uh, the product, the multiplication is a nonlinear operation, and that's the nonlinear thing that happens in the wave function interactions. Uh, 
you have to have in addition to the geometry and the fields you have to have a, a mass gap you have to define the scale of space and the, the way to do that in qed is is with the lightest charged uh, rest mass particle to couple to the photon so the basic photon electron interaction of qed uh, that's the mass gap and so the compton wavelength of the electron is what defines the scale of space in this model and what comes up with the interaction, because the, the, the Clifford products, they change dimensionality, that, that when you do this in the geometric rather than the, the matrix representation, uh, where, where the poly sigma matrices are the basis vectors of 3D space and direct those are space time. When you do it in the geometric representation, the, the, the interaction of uh, two three-dimensional wave functions gives you six-dimensional phase space. The wedge product increases the dimensionality. The dot product reduces the dimensionality. The sum of the two is the way, is, is the Clifford product. So the the sixty phase space, the, the each of the three orientational degrees of freedom needs its own phase. So uh, phase if uh, times the integral of phase, and so so time emerges from the interactions. That's how we get time in this model. We don't have to put it in by hand. And there's no free parameters, so everything you see in what follows, it emerges from, from, uh, from these basic assumptions. So the, the division algebras, there's real complex quaternion and octonion. This is a one, one degree of freedom, two, the, the amplitude and the phase, three, the, the quaternion, three phases in a, in a scalar, and, and the octonion, seven phases in a scalar in math language. Uh, in the, the algebra language, in the physics language, we want to use the Clifford algebra, and there we have, we have uh, 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 <clears throat> the octonian, the vacuum wave function. Now, again, this thing is scale invariant, and and uh, the the geometric and, and QED scattering matrices. Uh, we'd we'd like to look at these. They're they're uh, uh, generated by the Clifford products. So if we we look ahead a little bit here, the division algebras. Uh, uh, there's only these four as shown by the Hurwitz algebra. So the vacuum wave function minim minimally and maximally complete is the natural vacuum wave function. All you really need if you want to understand this model is, is just this right here, the space-time algebra. Heston has booked, this was the 50th anniversary of it, and this was what he wrote back in 1966. There's no change in the text itself. All he did was add a preface, but the math, the physics, what he did here is uh, it was right, so it doesn't change. It's just been overlooked is the problem. Uh, we, we got stuck in the matrix representation instead of looking at the geometric representation. So this book, Professor Heston has, has it available on his, his web page here, and, and you can download it and get what you need of space-time algebra to, to do the, 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 the impedance model. Here, Heston shows a how uh, basically the... Uh, uh, all of the essential uh, mathematics of, of uh, 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 particle physics is contained here in, in the geometric algebra and the geometric calculus. How it works, if we, if we start with a couple of vector of a boson, the W and the Z, and we, we have them interact, the product, it changes the dimensionality. The wedge product, as you see here, it increases the dimensionality, and the dot product, it decreases the dimensionality. So. Uh, given that, that uh, the scalar and the vector are spin zero, vectors uh, are one dimensional, you need two dimensions to rotate. Uh, uh, and the bi vector is spin one half and the tri vector is spin one. When you start shifting dimensionality around, uh, you're, you're transforming fermions to bosons and bosons to fermions. So this is dynamic supersymmetry. Um, <clears throat> So given two vector bosons, now I know people like to think of these as, as being spin one, but it's really the W and the Z are not just a, a vector. They also have the spin one object, the tri vector, the magnetic charge. Uh, and given, given uh, the two vector bosons, the product, uh, the W dot, the dot and the, the wedge products, it transforms these, these two uh, one-dimensional vector bosons to a scalar boson and, and a bivector fermion. This is the Higgs in the top. Taken together, these four comprise a minimally complete 2D Clifford algebra, a scalar two vectors and a bivector. Now, the curious thing here, the sum mode is this, the sum of the mass and the, the, the Z and the W bosons 
at the level of a couple parts in a thousand is the mass of the top. The difference mode uh, is, is the bottom onium spectrum here, the, the dominant uh, decay mode. Uh, so there's no Higgs mass showing up in here, uh, which uh, might at least partially account for the fact that, that we uh, have a hard time calculating the Higgs mass. And again, I want to emphasize this is background independence. The algebra is a background independent algebra. There's no external reference frame. It's first person. So what the geometric uh, S matrix looks like is this. The scalar and the vector, they have singularities, the pole and the dipole. Uh, the pseudo-vector and the pseudo-scalar don't. Uh, they, they have spin in, instead. And, and their, their singularity, so to speak, is a topological singular, singularity. It's out at the boundary instead of in at the, at the, the core. <clears throat> so, so what we see is both uh, geometry and topology comprise this uh, geometric quantization. Here are the, the even eigenmodes, the even modes, uh, the even algebra is a scalar, the, the, the bivector, the quad vector, and the sexual vector with their scalars in, in the bivector and quad vector here in, in the weak interactions. Uh, they're they're uh, 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 the eigenmodes and, and the odd dimensional uh, uh, matrices here are not actually in algebra. They lack closure, uh, but they're, they're the, uh, they are in algebra when they're in the context of the full eight component algebra, but by themselves, they, they lack closure. And, and they uh, are the transition modes. So for instance, here, you've got the photon and the eight, uh, and the eight gluons. Um, so now if we look at how this works, if we go ahead and add uh, the, the flux quanta here, then what we see is that, that uh, We've got something that looks like this, that eight by eight matrix, but but now uh, it's uh, the Dirac's QED, which is the electric charge and the magnetic moment, but we, we've extended it to the full eight component wave function. And then we multiply them together and we get this scattering matrix here that, that uh, contains the nodes. <clears throat> so the impedances, I'm, I'm going to just brush over quick. We don't really need this for what we're doing, but just to give you a sense of, of uh, how it works, I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about it a little bit. First, it was lost in quantum mechanics. And for, for a topological inversion here, that, that uh, the mag for the magnetic charge, the inverse Rydberg and the Bohr radius are inside the Compton wavelength. And the, the tops and the Higgs and the, the super heavies and the classical radius are. So a consequence of this is magnetic charge is dark. It can't radiate. Uh, and the top, topological impedance, it, if we look at mechanical impedance, the units are kilograms per second. You'd expect more kilograms per second means more flow. However, in SI units, it means less flow. This is the impedance means less flow. So Bjorken was looking at this, Feynman was looking at this. Uh, uh, this topological inversion is what uh, uh, thwarted uh, uh, Bjorken back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, he thought it was going to thought it was going to be a powerful tool. He, uh, in his thesis, he presented an analogy between Feynman diagrams and electric circuits with the Feynman parameters playing the role of resistance, and in uh, uh, current sources and voltage drops. Uh, but but he had this inverted because of this topological thing, and this is very confusing. I tried to do this with conductances before I went to impedances and likewise got very confused and finally had to give up and work with impedances. So how it was found uh, basically was this with vibratory pile drivers. If you take a couple eccentric weights and you spin them synchronized in opposite directions, then they'll pull together down and then oppose each other horizontally and then pull together up and then oppose, oppose, oppose each other again horizontally. So what you've got is you've got uh, these synchronous counter-rotating eccentrics tra transforming 2D rotation to 1D translation. And this is an analog of the Clifford product interaction of the Dirac equation for counter-rotating in phase space. So it provides a simple shortcut to calculating quantized electromagnetic impedances. You can just calculate them mechanically and then convert to electromagnetic. You lose phase information because there's one phase here and there's two phases, three phases actually in, in uh, the electromagnetic approach. Uh, but but uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, 
if you had to figure this out uh, electromagnetically, I don't see how you could do it. I think uh, you have to start with the mechanical impedances. And I, if, if that's not true, I'd like to see the proof. I'd like to be proven wrong on that because it'd be nice to see. So uh, the paper on electron impedances you can find here at this link, the, what that building, designing, building, and operating these things, these, these pile drivers did was that they resulted in this paper here that analyzed the two-body problem in Mach's principle. And it, it, uh, this was submitted to the American Journal of Physics. Ed Taylor was the, the referee, the, the editor at the time. He was very helpful and referred me to uh, Professor Mary Ellen Cox at the University of Michigan in Flint. And, and she tried to help me with this. And I said, but it turns out that, that it was just uh, a little bit too different. The, the referees basically said there were no new ideas, even though we had calculations for the hydrogen atom and deflection of light by gravitation and escape velocity in there. We had quantum mechanics and gravity, but it wasn't quite enough. So here's a timeline. The problem basically with QED is all of this rest of this stuff of quantum impedances got figured out after QED was the foundation was laid and it got forgotten about. It just didn't find its way in a little bit here. The, 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 the quantum Hall impedance was discovered, which, uh, which uh, was the first uh, handed exact impedance quantization, but but it's only here where really uh, we start to understand uh, the electron impedances. So there's geometric impedances, topological impedances, and parametric impedances. The geometric, uh, the gravitational impedance, the Coulomb impedance, the, these are translation gauge fields. Uh, the motion is parallel to, uh, to the force, so they can do work, they can be shielded, they communicate both amplitude and phase. The topological impedances, the quantum hall, a Heronoff and Baum, centrifugal, chiral, three body. Uh, these are rotation gauge fields with the one over R squared potentials associated with anomalies. They're scale invariant, they communicate phase only. But they can't do work because the motion, uh, resulting motion is perpendicular to the force and they're the channel of non-local entang entanglement. So uh, it's important to be looking at the difference between the geometric and topological impedances. There's also this, this uh, circumstance that the, the geometric impedances are, uh, are parametric. Uh, they're scale dependent. So the, the, the thing that's the parameter is the scale as you try to move energy around in in, in space and, and, and uh, have it translate in a frequency domain or uh, which is basically uh, uh, the, the Fourier transform of, of time. Oh, hi. Hi. Do hi. you have our interior key? I do. I have the, the kitchen key. Yeah, we need that back. Okay, good. Okay. Can you really keep that? I'm looking for it here. <laughs> we need it. it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, the, uh, the library people just came to get the key to the kitchen, so I gave that back, and the lights came back on, so there was a, a, a good result of that. So anyhow, the parametric impedances, this is this nonlinear process you need for, for wave function collapse. That uh, The analogy for the electronic people is, is the variable capacitor, the veractor, which is used for modulating and, and moving energy around in the frequency domain and another analogy is the child pumping the, the swing at, at twice the natural frequency or bosons pumping fermions if you've got a spin one half fermion and and a, a spin one boson that's oscillating twice as fast then then this boson can pump the fermion and you get something that looks like a mexican hat potential if you shift the phases then then this inverts so uh, this is at the bottom instead. So, so the um, the impedance networks. If we just look briefly again, here's the scattering matrix, and we've got the various uh, 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 modes that that uh, uh, we were able to calculate. Uh, I only have sixteen. Uh, si I can only plot sixteen things in 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 MathCAD. The MathCAD I'm using. So I. I can't really plot all of these modes, but I have some of them plotted. And, and uh, uh, these symbol here is they correspond to the, the following slides. Out here, again, the magnetic charge, I just want to point out, there's this article by Witten in Physics Today where he talks about the topological duality of, of a magnetic and electric charge. And, and uh, 
in a recent issue of Concern Courier, I think probably June or so, June or July of, of 2022, uh, there was an interview with Witten where he said that, that he felt that this work that he did with, uh, with Nathan Seberg on, on uh, uh, topological duality of magnetic charge was his best piece of work. So this is an important piece of work if Witten says that. Um, <clears throat> So, and the reality is, is this matrix is not eight by eight, it's eight by eight by eight, it's a cube. Uh, so this cube I've, I keep showing you here in, in uh, the various slides, it's actually an eight by eight by eight cube. And, and the reason being that these orientational degrees of freedom that were degenerate, that would cause it to be eight by eight, now we've uh, broken the degeneracy by assigning them to the, uh, uh, the electric and magnetic flux quantitums. So, so to get the the uh, degrees of the orientational degrees of freedom back, we need a third axis in the scattering matrix. It becomes a cube, a tensor, so to speak. So here we see three, three, three. Uh, okay, so we come back here. Here's the photon, uh, left-handed and right-handed, and and, and uh, uh, it's comprised of a, 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 when they interact with each other, what you get is is a, a vector and a tri vector. Uh, the it's the interaction basically of a a, a, a vector a, a vector magnetic flux quantum and a, a bivector electric flux quantum, and here this topological duality. What happens is the the magnetic moment. It's not a dipole. It's not over here. It's an axial vector. It, it's a it's a bivector. Uh, so so that the this topological thing, it swaps the magnetic flux quantum and the magnetic moment. So the flux is quantized in the photon and, and it, uh, it, 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 uh, because it's, it's, it's quantized for the magnetic charge as the energy goes back and forth between magnetic and electric fields due to Maxwell's equations, it also has to be quantized for the, uh, for the, the electric flux quantum. So uh, this is what your photon, uh, where it sits in, in the scattering matrix. And, and these eight components here are the, uh, are the gluons. So then the photon here, we see a 13.6 EV photon. Uh, if, as it approaches the Bohr radius of a hydrogen atom, then, then uh, uh, what happens is the, the impedance of, of uh, the electron uh, uh, advances the magnetic field and it retards uh, the electric field of the photon. So it decouples them. Maxwell's equations no longer work. And, and the, the, the electric flux quantum goes to high impedance and the magnetic flux quantum goes to low impedance. So if you're, if you're an antenna designer, you have to know about this. The electrical engineers know about it, but this, this got lost in physics. You can't find uh, this near field photon impedance, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the basic Rosetta Stone of QED in, in, in the curriculum or the textbooks or the journals. Uh, this got lost. Uh, and what also got lost was the, the part here of the electron. The electron has to have a corresponding impedance that, that the photon can excite, and that got lost as well. So the, this, this was the first real clue after for, from 1975 when the two-body and Mox principle paper was written to 35 years later, this started to open the door. Well, I was working on uh, 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 the beam position monitor uh, pickups for the, the light source too at Brookhaven, I, uh, I realized there was something going on here with the photon impedance match to an electron. And a little over a year later, then, then the, uh, the electron impedances, this got sorted out, what was going on with that. And then a little over a year after that, uh, this was extended to uh, uh, the unstable particle spectrum, which you'll see on the next slide. So here we have the electron impedances. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you have capacitive impedances that go to zero as, as you go to the singularity. The, 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 singul the, 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 the singularity has no conductance. And the inductive impedances, the singularity has infinite inductance. So you can't impedance match to the singularity. On this log scale, it's at infinity over here uh, at the left. And the boundary of the universe is at infinity over here on the right on the log scale. Um, so the correlation between the nodes of the impedance network here and, and uh, 
the unstable particle lifetimes. This is, is uh, uh, the unstable particle lifetimes multiplied by the speed of light or the coherence lengths. And it's also the uh, wavelength of a photon. So the 0.511 MeV photon, its wavelength is the Compton wavelength of the electron. Uh, 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 a 13.6 EV photon, its, its wavelength is the inverse Rydberg. Uh, so, so we have a, an explanation here that I think is a, a beyond standard model explanation of the unstable particle lifetimes. You can calculate branching ratios from this. There's a lot you can do with it, uh, but we don't really need to go too deep into it here. Uh, if, you impedance mismatch, if you impedance match to the Planck length, if you take the same a wave function here in the same flux quantity and you can find them to the Planck length instead. Well, then instead of uh, the wave function having uh, uh, this energy, it's got the Planck energy. And the energy as it tries to escape from the Planck length, the Hawking photon is actually all eight components. And as it tries to radiate away, that's what it wants to do. It's reflected back by the impedance mismatches. So what actually makes it out here is is uh, uh, is how much energy gets out there is just the rest mass of the electron and all the rest of it gets reflected back here you see a primordial photon coming in exciting the vacuum wave function and and here you see the end of inflation uh we could talk about this for a long time but we don't need it for what we want to do here here we go the other way we look from the Planck length now all the way out to the the boundary of the observable universe and beyond uh, so we see that Mach scale again there where there's the bifurcation of the impedances. And then we've got a quarter wave resonance here. If you start out, if you say that the, the Hawking photon or the graviton, if you say the photon part of it uh, uh, or starts with uh, electric field and no magnetic field, uh, well, the, the, or the, the electric charge and, and no magnetic moment. Uh, and and uh, uh, so that that provides a repulsive a repulsive force, and, and but by the time it gets to here, the energy is all moved to the uh, to the magnetic field. So this is a quarter wave resonator, and and uh, uh, we find that that if we look at the the rest mass of the the electron, that it, it sits in the magnetic moment. If you calculate the uh, the interaction of the 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 uh, uh, Bohr magneton with with the, the vacuum. Uh, when the Bohr magneton is, is con confined to the uh, uh, Compton wavelength of the electron, then that energy is the rest mass of the electron. Uh, uh, that, that the interaction of uh, the energy of that mode of the, the uh, positive and negative uh, Bohr magnetons. Uh, so we go out further here. Here we have 10 to the minus EV, the axion. If you want to see the axion, we're bifurcated again here. I think there's a problem with the impedance impedance matching to try for your axion detectors to get this impedance match working somehow. There, the lights went off again. Uh, and here you see the energy is equally shared now uh, at the axion level, uh, the same as at the bifurcations. It's equally shared between rotation and translation gauge fields. Now, how we, we get out here to, to uh, basically, the solar system scale and, and gravitation then is at full uh, attractive strength here. That's, you know, the, the wave function is pulling things together. But then as, as we go on out to the boundary of the observable universe, the energy is going into the rotation uh, fields, the centrifugal. Centrifugal is trying to pull things apart. Uh, so, so we have a plausible explanation for dark energy here as well as a plausible explanation for dark matter in the topological inversion of, of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> magnetic charge. So the phanoplane, it's a visual mnemonic for driving octonian algebra, for remembering the, the multiplication of, of Clifford algebra. And here now we're, we're talking about doing it uh, in, in the geometric representation. We just talked about the sum of the, the dot and the wedge products. Uh, the, the, uh, what we'll see in the next slide is that spin behaves properly and dimensionality behaves properly in the Fano plane. And we'll also see this topological thing entering here. That, that, uh, in the conventional math representation, uh, which is a scalar plus seven square roots of negative one, a scalar plus seven phases, 
But you have to swap uh, these two basis vectors to get uh, a closure of the algebra. And, and uh, that is replicated by the topological duality of, of uh, the scalar electric and, and 3D pseudoscalar magnetic charge, as you'll see in the following slide. So then we talked about this, the, the swapping of the magnetic dipole and the flux quantum. So, so this is what we want to explore, this mix of spin dimensionality and topology and, and how it relates to violation of both dimensionality and spin conservation in the scattering matrix modes, even though uh, it, it behaves properly in, in the uh, Fano plane. So here we have it in the Fano plane. <clears throat> Um, the direction of the arrows is, is uh, determined by uh, the, the scalar, the electric charge, and uh, what would one expect to see if we look at the math representation, okay, is, is here we have E7 the, the, uh, at the center, which is our magnetic charge in, 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 in a, a spin one magnetic charge, a three dimensional object in, in the geometric representation. And then here we'd expect to have E1, E2, and E3. These are the, the vectors, uh, uh, but instead E4 is in there. We, we've swapped, we've, we've swapped uh, E3 and E4 here. And the claim is this is what we're doing in the, in, when we swap the uh, magnetic flux quantum and the Bohr magneton. Uh, and, and, and so this, this, this uh, how this behaves is how the, the math version behaves. If we look at it now where we want to look at uh, two things, dimensionality and spin, then, then we start out again with uh, uh, one-dimensional objects, which are vectors, two-dimensional objects, which are bivectors, and the three-dimensional object, which is a trivector. And uh, the two-dimensional objects are spin one-half, the trivectors spin one. And, and these guys here are spin zero. So if, if we if we multiply if we multiply a 2D and a 3D object, what comes out is their sum a 5D object and their difference a 1D object. So so now we've got this 5D object and this 1D object, and we have to multiply it again by a 1D object. So so the 5D multiplied by the 1D. Uh, uh, it gives you their sum, which is the six, and their difference, which is the four. And the one D multiplied by the one D gives you their sum, which is the two, and the zero D, which is the four. And the spin, you can either, these can either add or subtract, so you end up with spin one half and spin three halves. So what this shows is that both dimensionality and uh, spin are uh, behaving properly in the Fano plane when we do this in the Clifford algebra representation, it's, it's in, in the geometric representation instead of the scalar plus seven phases. Um, so there's some more material here. I don't think I'm going to dig into this any deeper at the moment. Uh, uh, but this is worth a mention here. This was from Neutrino 2020. You can find this poster here at, at, at that link. In addition to the topological inversion, as we say, we've got this, uh, in a, uh, uh, there's another topological anomaly here that, that the, the magnetic flux quantum and the, the trivector magnetic charge, they're numerically identical, yet they're topologically and geometrically distinct. So this, uh, the neutrino wave function then, if we say how we're going to de define a neutrino wave function is, and all, all experimental data is consistent with massless neutrinos. So, so if we say that the neutrino wave function, we're just going to take the photon, and now we're going to add this thing that, that's like a magnetic flux quantum, except it's 3D instead of 1D. It's a topological variant on the photon, adding a flux quantum uh, configured as a tri-vector magnetic charge rather than the, the vector magnetic flux quantum. So these, these three components, when you define them to the electron Compton wavelength, uh, they're at, this, at the sub Harper billion accuracy of, of the, the fundamental constants that define the coupling constant, uh, this is the electron rest mass. So we get a, a good number for the electron rest mass, uh, but we're not talking about the electron now, we're talking about the photon. It, the point is that, that many of these uh, 
uh, uh, fundamental geometric objects of, of the wave function when confined to uh, to the electron Compton wavelength, they give the, the uh, electron mass. That, that the origin of the electron mass in, in this model is uh, the field energies. So in the neutrino, the flavor is determined by the longitudinal component, and, and the differential phase shifts of the magnetic charge relative to the photon is what causes it to oscillate. Where, where the, the uh, and, and associativity limits the possible three-body modes. So when you apply uh, the geometric products to the possible mode sequences like we do here, uh, uh, so three plus two uh, of, of, of uh, the, the, the tri-vector and, and the vi-vector, we get this five plus one, we get the six, four, two, oh. And if, uh, if, we, if we do it in the other order, then we get the six, zero, four, two. Now, uh, it's not clear to me what's going on here, whether this is, is the, the prohibited chirality, and this is what's permitted, this is our left-handed universe, um, or, or, or uh, whether, whether uh, uh, this is the antiparticle and this is the particle. I think that this is probably the prohibited, so I think by what I'm saying here is wrong, that it's not the anti-neutrino, it's the one that we don't see. So, so out of the, the, there's many, there's eight possible, how many possibilities are the, the iterations of this? Uh, eight of them, I believe that, that uh, and only one of them actually uh, preserve dimensionality and uh, doesn't violate uh, uh, left-handed, left-handed universe. So, so now if we want to look at spin and dimensionality in the scattering matrix, so here now we're coming back to the, the geometric S matrix with the spin uh, thrown in dimensionality, the spin thrown in the dimensionality is already part of the matrix. And so if we take the product of, of two vectors, then what comes out is a scalar and a bivector. And right away we're, we're, develop, we're, we're, we're violating conservation of angular momentum here. So the fact that... Um, We've got vector minus axial vector uh, uh, going on here, and, and this is an axial vector. Uh, well, okay, so this is playing somehow in V minus A. Uh, all of these vector interactions here, other than, than just the, the interaction of a vector with a scalar where there's no dimensionality change, all of them violate conservation of angular momentum. And, and the higher dimensionality ones also violate conservation of dimensionality. So the eigenmodes of the eigenmodes, the only one that, that, that uh, uh, violates on axis, the only one that violates is, here is, is, is the scalar and the bivector. How this is related to the axion and, and conservation of energy in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, CP violation in SU3 uh, uh, remains to be figured out. So this is our potential issue here that we've got this, the, the, how, how we treat this. Um, <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to look at, the, for, for the muon collider, we want to look at the decay of the muon here. And we can see that, that uh, uh, dimensionality seems to be preserved on you know, here if, in the sense that anti neutrino and neutrino, if, if you say they do opposite things, uh, then you've got uh, the muon with uh, uh, an electric charge, uh, a, a magnetic flux quantum, and a, a, a magnetic uh, moment. And we've done the same thing with the muon that we did with the neutrino. We started with an electron and we've added a component. And here, instead of adding the, the um, magnetic charge, uh, we've added the, the magnetic flux quantum, which is numerically identical to, uh, to the tri-vector magnetic charge. So, so in, the, in the impedance model, this is our photon, and, and we, we add the, uh, uh, the magnetic charge to the photon or for the electron. Uh, this is the electron, and then we, we add uh, the, the magnetic flux quantum. And uh, uh, the field energy of these quanta here for the muon, if you calculate the mass from this, it's, it's a, the three parts per thousand. It's, it's uh, the next higher uh, iteration of one over two pi alpha uh, uh, 
and this is it in lowest order. Now our goal here is to calculate the neutrino mixing matrix. I think we have to do this to convince the muon people that there's some possibility the scheme we're offering here can work. Uh, and we've got three choices we can work with. We can work with the neutrino mixing matrix, how it excites the vacuum, the muon mixing matrix, how it excites the vacuum, or how the muon excites the neutrino. Uh, for, for an example here, I'm, I'm just doing the, uh, uh, the neutrino uh, mixing matrix, how the neutrino excites the vacuum. Uh, but it, it could be that really we need to be working with this mixing matrix here. And uh, these, these uh, the, the mode energies here, there's a lot of degeneracy. All of these different modes have basically the same energy. So this is how you define topological protection is, is that uh, you have to have these, these degenerate modes. And, and the argument is that, that this is what uh, prevents us from seeing the neutrino, that it's a photon that's topologically pr protected by uh, the action of the, the magnetic charge. So, again, here's our neutrino wave function, the, the photon plus the magnetic charge. And, and uh, if we look at how, how things behave here, so we've got this phenomena going on here, that, that we've got uh, these violations of spin and, and dimensionality. Now, it could be it doesn't matter that we can go ahead and calculate the, the uh, neutrino mixing matrix without that. Uh, to do that, uh, you know, if we, we take these components of the neutrino, uh, then, then it turns out that, that uh, these are the, uh, the nodes that are of interest. So, so how we get from, from calculating uh, these nodes here and the coherence lengths, that's what we want to calculate is the coherence lengths from this. Uh, that, that's something that uh, has to be figured out yet. And that's what we're working on right now. Uh, so there's sort of a summary here. All of the experimental data is consistent with massless neutrinos. Uh, and, and we present an outline of this, this uh, a possibility of, uh, for massless oscillation uh, that's grounded in these two concepts that were lost. And uh, uh, this could per perhaps be helpful for, for uh, 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 the next big collider. Now, the here we're talking about the fact that the, 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 for the neutrino there's the surface modes, but in addition to the Rubik's cube with the surface modes, we've also got that central mode right, right there. If we expand this to eight by eight, and the central mode then is a three-body mode for it to be an observable. You you don't see it on the surface. You have to, and if you ex expand this now to the eight by eight of 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 this, now it's eight by eight by eight. So all of all of the two body modes are on the face and the two body modes are what what we're plotting here and, and what we've plotted we've plotted uh, in, in these figures as well. Uh, the three body modes, the three body modes uh, are on the interior and the neutrino is the first one of the three body modes that we're trying to sort out. We'd also like to to get to the CKM metrics in, in the three component uh, uh, the, th the three three quarks and, and see how that behaves. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, the the intent the next time I expect to be actually making a presentation, I hope to be able to talk about uh, uh, the neutrino mixing matrix. We'll see how that goes. And I sure could use some help with that if anybody's interested in stepping into this. So how do I, I want to uh, okay, I'll stop share for the moment, and now I want to stop recording, stop recording.